thank you for this opportunity. And uh, in these tough times, <clears throat> I know uh, we can all use some good news. So I'm going to present uh, some good news tonight. But this this is science on tap, so I'm encouraging everyone to uh, pour yourself a nice drink. This is a, a beer brewed in Maryland that I have right here. Cheers, everybody. So <clears throat> I like this picture very much because it uh, describes a lot of what we're up to. The airplane that you can see is uh, a NASA research aircraft, a P-3, um, during an experiment called Discover AQ for air quality. This picture was taken on Maryland's eastern shore, and you can see the, it's a very wet estuarine sort of environment. Um, right in the middle of the picture is the Indian River coal-fired power plant that's just over the border in Delaware. And uh, that one is the last coal-fired power plant in Delaware. And all of them in Maryland are now slated for uh, replacement. If you look very carefully, you can even see a haze layer in the back there, and that's the local air pollution. So this is basically uh, going to be uh, some good news, a review of the trends in air quality in the United States. If you ask a lot of people, say, hey, what's, you know, how is air quality today compared to a few decades ago? Many people will say it's much worse. This is mostly not true. And then uh, the COVID provided a really unique opportunity for us to investigate. First, some motivation. This is a, a study published in The Lancet. This is not my paper. Um, it's a medical journal. <clears throat> Although uh, one of the University of Maryland faculty members, Maureen Cropper, who used to be the chair of our economics department, is a co-author on this. And this hits it uh, pretty solidly. Uh, in 2015, there were 9 million premature deaths. This is worse than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined, and 15 times more than from all armed conflict. So it's a big issue. This is something I have uh, borrowed from uh, GBD stands for Global Burden of Disease, study that came out comparing um, 1990 to last year. And you can see different causes of uh, disease and death uh, and how they've changed. <clears throat> Some things like child and maternal malnutrition have improved substantially over the past 30 years. Other things have not, including the things that haven't improved on a global scale is air pollution. So uh, you can see the different colors on here represent um, different uh, types of risks, metabolic risks. The uh, green ones are environmental and the purple ones are behavioral. So to put things in perspective, this is uh, an actual photograph taken in London during the daytime. So this was in the big smog, uh, just even before I was born in 1952. Over the course of three days for this serious uh, smog event, smog uh, portmanteau meaning a combination of smoke and fog, and that's exactly what it was here. A lot of coal burning for home heating. This is in the middle of winter. Um, in fact, the anniversary. <clears throat> and over the course of three days, there were 3,000 excess deaths over what would be expected in a big city like London. Well, it wasn't just London. This is Denora, Pennsylvania, not far from here. That picture was taken at two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, <clears throat> that's also a sulfurous smog. And you can see that uh, it was uh, very severe and hundreds of people died in that. So this is a, a photograph from about 1970 of New York City. And I'll be talking about measurements from Washington to New York, uh, actually all the way up and down the East Coast today. And that haze was pervasive. It was very common. It doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, and this is uh, our Liberty Lady uh, checking out the air quality, or maybe she's responding to the recent election. I'm not sure. But what causes this? I'll, I'll try to keep the heavy duty science to, uh, to a minimum and um, explain things in, in terms that uh, the general public uh, can understand. So most of the morbidity and mortality comes from fine particulate matter. 
It has to be a certain size range because if the particles are really big, they get stuck in your upper, upper respiratory system and uh, don't get in deep into the alveoli of your lungs. If they're too small, they diffuse too quickly and likewise get stuck in your upper respiratory system. We're talking pretty small particles, less than two and a half microns. To put that in perspective, that's a, an image of a human hair and these are the particles that really matter and that's very fine uh, beach sand. So there are <clears throat> limits on this for 24 hours or an annual mean in the US. It is pretty well accepted now by uh, public health experts that 12 micrograms per cubic meter is not protective of human health. There's still something like 45,000 <clears> excess deaths in the United States alone due to air quality. Uh, a lot of that is this fine particulate matter. Much of it is made in the atmosphere. That's what I mean by secondary here. You can see it uh, because it's close to the wavelength of light causes haze. And a lot of it traditionally comes from SO2, sulfur dioxide from high sulfur coal. It's also organic compounds that come from a variety of sources. Um, NOx comes from uh, oxides of nitrogen from all combustion. And this is ammonia. The primary source there is agriculture, so the farmers don't get off scot-free. Well, before I talk about the good news, here's a little bit of bad news. This was from today's New York Times. <clears throat> Despite what health experts say, uh, they declined to change from 12 to 9 micrograms per cubic meter. That would have saved tens of thousands of lives in the United States over the next each year over the next few years. All right. Um, Oh, and uh, I wanted to point out that <clears throat> it's uh, a little bit controversial, but there are a number of studies indicating that um, exposure to heavy doses of air pollution can uh, exacerbate your sensitivity to the coronavirus. So uh, yet another reason to try to keep clean air. This was, I think, the first paper that came out in, a, in this journal, Environmental Pollution, about Northern Italy and uh, their conclusion was that uh, you're more likely to develop a chronic respiratory problem if you have heavy exposure to air pollution. The second major cause, and I'll try to keep the chemistry simple, is um, what's called Los Angeles smog. It's different from London type smog. We call it photochemical smog because if you think about Los Angeles, the weather couldn't be too much more different than it is in London quite different from London. It's warm and sunny, and the composition is completely different. It's mostly this compound ozone. Ozone aloft is good. It protects us from dangerous solar ultraviolet radiation, but it's not good to breathe. It causes premature aging of the lungs and is linked to morbidity and mortality. How do you make it? You need organic compounds and carbon monoxide. Again, these oxides of nitrogen that are really important. They're important for the bay too, but that's a different uh, uh, a different seminar. And you have to have bright sunshine to do it. So it's a summer problem. This is the one pollutant for which the state of Maryland is currently in uh, what's called non-attainment. In other words, we violate the national ambient air quality standards for ozone. It's probably not what kills the most people in Maryland, but it is what we are currently technically legally non-attainment. All right. Now, uh, in this year 2020. I'm sure people are ready for some good news. Remember what I said first, think about how, how is air quality compared to previous years? Well, these are the official EPA reports of total emissions. They have innumerable issues um, with their accuracy, but the trend should be good. Uh, and uh, the, the general idea is sound. So these are emissions of sulfur dioxide, that which makes London type smog. And you can see back in the 60s and 70s, we had more than 10 times as much SO2 being emitted into the atmosphere as we have today. So it's gone down very nicely. A lot of that improvement is because it's more economical to generate electricity with natural gas today than it is with coal. So coal's disappearing. Um, our home state here in Maryland, um, only recently really implemented 
uh, strong controls over sulfur dioxide. There was something called the Healthy Air Act. And it's somebody who lives right around the corner who, who pushed that act through. This is uh, Senator Paul Pinsky. And I wanna show very quickly, these are the SO2 emissions uh, in Maryland as a total. That's when the act went into effect, boom, they just plummeted just like that. NOx has gone down too. And uh, the carbon monoxide, uh, carbon, sorry, dioxide heat and load and everything, they haven't changed much because we still need electricity and we're still using electricity. So uh, alas, the CO2 hasn't gone down. Uh, this stops at 2013. I'll show some, some updates that on that. Okay, this is carbon monoxide. <clears throat> when I was a graduate student um, in, uh, in Boulder, living in Boulder, uh, the front range would sometimes get so much carbon monoxide, you would get a headache from it. It can dull your wits. Good excuse for not doing well on an exam. But what things were like in the 70s, versus today, there's this a magnificent improvement, maybe leveling off a little bit now because it's harder to squeeze the last controls out of uh, cars and other sources, but magnificent improvements in air quality with respect to carbon monoxide. That's what's called a criteria pollutant because it has a substantial negative impact on morbidity and mortality, also contributes to Los Angeles type smog, uh, so it's not something you want in the atmosphere in any high concentrations. These are oxides of nitrogen. They uh, are toxic in and of themselves, contribute to eutrophication, that is harmful algal blooms in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I mean, sorry, eutrophication and harmful algal blooms in the bay in such areas. Uh, and this took a little longer before we really made any progress. It wasn't until after 2000 that we saw some big increases and that had a profound influence on uh, photochemical smog production. So there's some good news. Organic compounds, remember I said Los Angeles type smog, you need organic compounds as well as sunshine and oxides of nitrogen. They've come down too, not as dramatically as SO2, but we're moving nicely there. This is very complicated because there are natural sources of organic compounds. The smell of a Christmas tree, for example, it's called pinene. And when combined with air pollution, uh, compounds like pinene can make a, a dangerous particles and, uh, can, and uh, related compounds make ozone. Okay, so those were the official reports issued by EPA. Um, did it work? Is, there, is it true? Uh, is there any proof for this? Let's take a look. Show me. Here's some uh, analysis of ambient measurements. It's a little bit busy here, but these are observations from uh, the Baltimore, Washington area of uh, smog in Maryland. And the, the top line on here is uh, the uh, ambient NO2. In other words, the NO2 measured uh, in the cities and and other sites where they have monitors. And it's come down very nicely. You, there's a seasonal cycle. That's what that sawtooth pattern is there. Uh, higher in the winter, lower in the summer. This is carbon monoxide. That has likewise come down from thousands of these units to just a couple hundred now. It's wonderful. And this is the ozone, the Los Angeles type smog. <clears throat> and it's uh, uh, plotted here in a funny way. One on there means unity. That means whenever it was a hot day, back in the 70s, 80s, and most of the 90s, you were pretty well guaranteed that in Baltimore and Washington, there was going to be a smog event, uh, a code red day, a violation of the ambient air quality standard. Well, that has come down substantially recently. We're still, uh, we're still not in attainment. And we have, a, this is a, a weekday and weekend, by the way. Uh, and that's because there's a lot more traffic on weekdays than in weekends. Uh, but we're making great progress on here. That uh, Sandra Roberts, one of my graduate students, is uh, is working on that. She and Ross Solowich, another professor in the department. So there's some evidence from roadside monitors. If you don't trust uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment, you might trust NASA. This is a beautiful demonstration of satellite observations of air pollution. This is nitrogen dioxide, part of the NOx that we're talking about, causes chemical pneumonia in high concentrations, leads to smog. Here it was 15 years ago, and here it is uh, last year. So the hotter the color, the more NO2, big improvement. This is sulfur dioxide, that which makes, oh, I forgot to mention acid rain. Both of these things make acid rain. That problem is pretty much gone now. 
And uh, concentrations are way down, much improved, a huge benefit to um, human health in the United States. Uh, these, the laws for controlling the sulfur emissions actually went into effect in the Clean Air Act Amendment of uh, 1990 under the first Bush administration. So here's the change for um, SO2 in red and NO2 in, uh, in blue. And there's some evidence that maybe recently we've stagnated progress a little bit. Well, uh, people often ask, well, what about the rest of the world? What are they doing? And it's a, a mixed bag. This is East Asia. So again, the hotter the color, the more pollution. And for nitrogen dioxide, uh, this is China, by the way. So there's Japan, Korea, and this is uh, Herbei. Um, and uh, some of the other heavily industrialized uh, provinces of China, Beijing is up here. So this is south of Beijing, where there's lots of heavy industry. <clears throat> and NO2 got worse for a while, but it's improved most recently. But the Chinese have done a wonderful job controlling the sulfur emissions. Um, this is seen from aircraft on the ground as well. So they have really made progress on uh, SO2 that leads to fine particulate matter. Big improvements there. Okay, some more good news. Um, this is a picture taken on a smoggy day just a few years ago. It's still much better than 1970. That's a, a long fetch there, uh, so it looks hazy. But here's a picture taken this year during uh, some COVID restrictions. The sky is actually blue. That's looking at, at, uh, at New York there. Oh, and Shinrong Ren gets the credit. He does the heavy lifting for much of our aircraft flights. Okay, what about greenhouse gases? This is for the whole planet. Uh, starting in 1900, and you can see this apparently inexorable increase in emissions of CO2 <clears throat> with some minor changes here and there for economic uh, problems. Maybe a little bit of a, a lessening of the rate of increase recently, uh, but that's for the whole world. And how's the US doing? We are really only responsible for a fraction of that. And here's a close up of the last uh, uh, 40 ish years of 50 years for uh, the US. Uh, notice it doesn't start at zero. So it's 4,000 going up to 6,000 of these tons of carbon dioxide per year. In the last, last uh, couple of decades, there's been some improvement. And that's, of course, not led by uh, any sort of national effort. Individual states and consortia of states have implemented these restrictions. For example, uh, the current administration in Annapolis has uh, put us on a path to achieve 40 by 30. That means a 40% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. And we're actually on track to do that. Uh, uh, Senator Pinsky has proposed uh, uh, that the state become more aggressive, 60 by 2030, and become totally carbon neutral by the year 2045. So there are even more uh, aggressive anti-global warming, uh, clean air proposals pending. Okay, so that's the, the not so good news is um, climate impacts are not being uh, mitigated as quickly as direct health effects. So what, uh, so what happened when things were shut down because of COVID? First, I wanna talk about, uh, there's a nice roadside monitor uh, you are here in College Park. This is I-95. Uh, so it uh, connects Baltimore and Washington. And the Maryland Department of the Environment and the University have instrumented a trailer right there next to I-95. So it picks up emissions from the cars that are going by and the trucks that are quite a few. And there's a nice traffic counter not too far away. So we know, and that distinguishes trucks from cars and so on. So we can keep track of what's coming out of cars and trucks there. Uh, we have a close up, there we go. That's what the monitor looks like. If you're near Savage, Maryland, you can see it on uh, the west side of the highway. It does meteorological measurements and all sorts of trace gases and aerosols. And uh, the student who's been working on analyzing these data is uh, this Dolly Hall. Um, we just had her first paper published. Nice work uh, demonstrating uh, a temperature impact on emissions. All right, uh, this is kind of a, a funny looking uh, busy slide, so I'll take a minute to explain it. This is uh, the traffic counts. 
and it's a total daily traffic. The blue on here is total traffic and the red <clears throat> are trucks more than 50 feet long. So those are mostly diesel. Now it's a weird sawtooth pattern. What is that? That's because during the week, there's a lot more traffic than on weekends. You see a, a big dramatic change. Well, uh, right about here, the COVID restrictions were implemented and you can see total traffic fell to half of what it would have been. Ordinarily, you'd actually see an increase as you go into spring and summer. Uh, and it went down to half of what it had been. Truck traffic changed less dramatically, but it still fell off. The other thing I wanna show on here is um, these orange bars are violations. They're ozone exceedances. That's when we got into trouble for having more ozone than the EPA allows. But that's actually good news because it's only three. We can normalize, we can forecast how many ozone episodes there should be based on the weather. We know from years of experience how many violations we'll get based on temperature and stagnation. And there should have been six when we saw three. So that's, uh, that's good news. That tells us where we would be. And this isn't a 50% reduction. It's a modest like 30% reduction in the car traffic. Well, cars are not the only source of pollution. and Car traffic isn't a perfect uh, metric for air pollution. But here are the observations um, next to the site. This is carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen. The blue lines last year, the red lines this year, you can see the decrease that kicked in just about the mandatory telework. And then after the stay at home order was lifted, we kind of went back to normal. It's actually a little bit better improvement in CO than it looks like on here because there's a global background, a natural background around here. So it's a substantial uh, improvement in CO and a good measurable improvement in oxides of nitrogen. That's just one site at, uh, at one, one place in Maryland. So here is everything for the East United States between Virginia and Maine. And uh, this indicates that orange lines this year, all the other colored dash lines are the previous years. So you can see during the lockdown, there was a nice improvement in carbon monoxide measured roadside. And if you take out the background on there, that's about a 40% improvement in carbon monoxide. These are oxides of nitrogen. Uh, you don't have the background issue so much there, but you can see indeed, if you look at all of the sites, these are the averages for all the sites, we're getting a nice improvement in the emissions. And a lot of that's due to trucks. So it's not just cars, but trucks. Diesel makes a lot of uh, this kind of pollution that poisons the bay and makes Los Angeles smog and fine particulate matter. Okay, well, the surface can only give you so much information. These are two of my highly valued colleagues in front of a Cessna that uh, we have instrumented. You can look at the nose of the Cessna. It has these funny things there. That's a sampler for particles, and the one that looks like a candy cane is for trace gases. And these stainless steel cans are for collecting air that we have analyzed elsewhere. So that's Shinrong Ren, a research scientist recently uh, now employed by uh, NOAA and uh, <clears throat> Phil Stratton, a graduate student in our department. This was written up uh, last June in the New York Times. So they were very proud of themselves. Uh, it was a nice description. And uh, just to prove that I can still do honest work, uh, that's me um, in front of our Cessna. I did some flights this summer. Oh, behind it, by the way, is uh, a slightly nicer airplane, a Gulfstream 5, a fancy executive jet uh, owned by Under Armour. So we did some actual flights this summer. And uh, although I may have, Shinrong had worries that I will have forgotten how to operate the instruments. This is just another pretty picture uh, that uh, was taken from the Cessna <clears throat> looking at New York City during uh, the partial lockdown. If you look very carefully, you can see very uh, light traffic on the highways. An excellent visual range. Well, that's not very quantitative. So uh, this is a map. That's the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Delaware, and we're down here. So these are the flight tracks that we flew with our airplane in April and May. Um, so in the heavy part of the lockdown and as we came out of it. So we investigated both Baltimore, Washington, and New York City. This is carbon dioxide and methane, another important greenhouse gas. We measured lots of gases and aerosols. 
Uh, and if you fly a box around a city, there's a mathematical trick you can do to estimate the total flux. We'll try to see what the difference is. I won't go into too much detail there. But the hotter the color here, the more carbon dioxide there is in the global background somewhere down here. Uh, a quick view, some actual data that gives you an impression. The blue is before the COVID restrictions and the red is after. So this is carbon monoxide and you can see a dramatic improvement. These are actual observations flying downwind of uh, uh, Baltimore and Washington. So you can see immediately that there was a substantial improvement. All right, my apologies to those of you who don't like mathematics, just ignore the double integral up there. That's the math we use to calculate the flux. Um, if we fly profiles downwind we and upwind, we can look at the difference and that tells us how much is coming out of the box. If the box is over city, we can tell you what the city's making and see if we're uh, having any progress on emissions controls. This is uh, a little easier to understand. This is just an example of a trace gas CO2 as we fly by. Each of these really sharp spikes is a coal-fired power plant. They're on the way out, by the way. And these big kind of broad plumes are the city plumes with the spikes embedded. That's the Brandon Shores power plant. So that's Washington and the Baltimore plume as we flew by. Well, we can analyze those to see what the total flux was. But, but before I do that, Here's something from uh, NASA again. This is the difference between this year and uh, some average adjusted for weather in the past few years. This was March. If you see blue on there, don't worry about the units. That just means there was an improvement. If it's red or hotter colors, that means um, there was a statistically significant worsening of air quality. But most, if you look at most of the cities on here, uh, Baltimore, Washington, New York, and the whole of the Ohio River Valley, we see blue. So there was a nice improvement in March relative to the baseline. So the a summary of the COVID impacts are, it's easy to detect an impact. Getting hard numbers is actually a lot more work. At the peak of the restrictions, total carbon dioxide, which is the most important greenhouse gas, was down by about a third in the Baltimore, Washington area. It's still down, but not that much. Carbon monoxide, because people are driving much less than they were. Um, we can track gasoline sales too, for example, and they're, they're way down. Um, carbon monoxide has improved even more, maybe down to half of what it was. The, um, the more toxic pollutants like oxides of nitrogen are down as well, and not just locally, but throughout the US. It's much harder to determine changes in some of these other species. Methane comes in large part uh, from nature, but also from leakage in natural gas. Uh, Baltimore, for example, has the oldest natural gas delivery system in America. And uh, it, it, bad news, it leaks, it leaks a lot. The good news is there are plans to improve it. And we think we have some evidence that's getting better. This uh, fine particulate matter is, is down as well but it's hard to determine exactly how much because it's so sensitive to weather. The interesting one, photo, photochemical smog or Los Angeles smog is much harder to, uh, to pick out because it has such strange nonlinear photochemistry. We've done a whole lot better here and that's probably because we're a smaller city and we've had strict controls on the, what, are, what are called the precursors, the things that make Los Angeles type smog. So we saw a big improvement. New York and Connecticut uh, did not. So Maryland used to have the dubious distinction of having the worst air quality in the Eastern US. That uh, honor has gone to Connecticut now because they're downwind of New York City. So anyway, this was a great opportunity to ask the question, for example, what would happen if overnight half of the cars on the highway were electric and uh, the electricity was generated by uh, some non-polluting renewable source? So these are the kinds of improvements we would expect. Ah, I had a request to talk about, this is one of my pet peeves, leaf blowers. Um, and I've just stolen this funny uh, video that uh, why are they bad? Well, they, they aren't all powered by two stroke engines, but many are, and those are the noisy ones. And two stroke engines are basically machines for turning gasoline into air pollution. If you put a kilogram of carbon into the tank on there, 
a third of the carbon comes out as carbon dioxide, a third is carbon monoxide, highly toxic, and a third is totally uh, unburned hydrocarbons. So those are bad things. So what can you do to improve air quality? Get rid of anything that's an old two-stroke engine, unless it's an emergency chainsaw or something. Uh, leave your, uh, uh, minimize, keep your car well tuned, or better still, leave it in the garage and uh, walk or bike. There are actually things you can do with your diet. A plant-based diet has a less impact on the environment and minimize your electricity use or try to get it from uh, renewable sources. So here are the take-home messages um, and you can read them the, yourselves. It's really rewarding to uh, a nerdy scientist to see that uh, occasionally policymakers actually use the science to guide the policy and we can uh, realize remarkable improvements in things like acid rain, uh, visibility, and uh, photochemical smog. So next we'll tackle greenhouse gases.